Um, this is not my first time here at the Inventors Association. Um, so I've had um, several um, uh, opportunities to talk about Opal and Kubipedia and stuff like that, but a very different um, uh, presentation uh, this evening. Um, hopefully that the title of Your Idea, Your Responsibility has attracted you some to think about what's this. But I must confess tonight we're actually going to talk about babies. Babies. Who, know what, who, who knows what a baby is? Yeah. So we're going to talk about babies. Not the human kind, not the furry kind, but your ideas. Because I know for a fact, having met some of you, that your ideas, <coughs> your inventions, are your babies. Um, and with babies comes a bit of responsibility. And talk to Spider-Man, you know, quoting Spider-Man here, if those of you who have watched Spider-Man, is that with great power comes what? Great responsibility. great responsibility. So when you have an idea or an invention or an innovation, number one, it's your baby. You're very protective of it. But you get a lot of responsibility for it. And two weeks ago, I became a great uncle. Woohoo! For the first time. And it's all changed. My boys, children, are now 27 and 26, and things are very different these days to back then. Like, for example, I couldn't go to the hospital. They only allowed two people in. So, you know, those big family gatherings of everybody turning up to welcome the new baby after birth? No more. You had to choose. The father could come. The grandma could come, and then two other people could come. They had to go. Before I could see my little baby nephew, within six weeks, I had to go and get a whooping cough injection. We, in the past, we always in, you know, immunised the babies. Now everybody's got to get immunised. Um, they don't wrap them like we used to. Now they've got to have their hands free. Remember how we used to waddle them up and so there was a lot of changes with that and that's really the essence of what I'm talking about today. Some of you are veterans at inventions and innovations and we used to do things a certain way. What I want to share with you is my experience and knowledge of how things have changed if we're going to do something with those ideas, those inventions, um, those innovations, those babies because the world has changed, the system has changed, and I hope that as a result of tonight, you'll have some more idea about what the changes are in the world of innovation, startup, investment, that might help you with those things. It means you may have to unlearn, let go of some of the things that we did it. So I don't want to hear any words like, but Sash, in the good old days, because what do we forget about the good old days? The tough old days. So we've got to think about what sort of things do we need to be aware of today, how things work, the machinery of government, the machinery of investment, the tools and the process that are available to us to then progress those ideas and those innovations. Um, does that make sense? You're all, yeah, lots of nods here, so uh, that's sort of just laying the foundation of what we're going to talk about this evening. Now, some of this stuff takes three months to go through, 12 months, so I'm going to really condense you, just touch on those things. And if anything triggers you any further information that you want from that, then there are programs out there that will dwell deeper into those things. Um, you'll be able to go online and have a look at some of those things. There's videos, there's YouTubes on those particular subjects, but I just want to leave those things with you so that you can then follow up because we certainly don't have the amount of time to actually look into those in depth. Um, it is an interactive uh, presentation, so if you've got questions, um, please uh, let's talk it through, uh, but I know that at the end there's always time for some questions about some of the information there. Okay. Uh, so firstly, I just want to um, uh, pay respects to the Ghana people, the Aboriginal people of uh, the region. Um, I think yesterday we had a look at uh, 
Um, that you know, there's about 456 nations in here. And when you go to the museum, you'll see a lot of the inventions and innovations that Aboriginal people have done. In fact, um, most of our environmental protections now, including rangers, we've discovered all of a sudden that perhaps Aboriginal people are the best rangers to have to look after the land, including some of the burn-offs that they do now before bushfires have been acknowledged as ancient knowledge. Um, and we're starting to use some of those in many practices. So because we're meeting on the land of the Ghana people, we want to acknowledge the elders past, present, and those that are emerging. There's a lot of new elders coming out. And we also acknowledge their connection to the land uh, themselves, but also with us as well. Um, just a little bit about the Polaris Centre where um, I have the privilege of working at the moment um, as a team leader. Uh, most people are, are generally not aware of the Polaris Centre, uh, but the Polaris Centre is actually funded by uh, the City of Salisbury and, and grants and our clients who pay for our services as well. Um, where uh, we've been around since about 2001. Um, a fun fact, I used to be a customer of the Polaris Centre way back when I launched something called Boss Camp. Um, and it's so amazing to now be part of that team to, to help and grow other businesses and entrepreneurs. Uh, we're based at Technology Park at Mawson Lakes. I imagine most of you have heard of Mawson Lakes and Technology Park has been around for ages. Absolutely beautiful environment, originally sort of built by Delphin, very similar to West Lakes and Golden Grove. It's one of those sort of pinnacle developments in our community, a lot of wetlands, uh, a lot of recycling of stormwater back into the system. So some amazing environmental technologies. But we've also got the likes of Kodan and Raython and defence industries that are based in that area as well. Um, Polaris actually stands for uh, North Star. Who's heard of the North Star? I, I think most of you guys are. Uh, so the Polaris Centre, like the North Star, is actually there as a guide to entrepreneurs and to businesses. Uh, sailors from, for uh, a very long time used to use the North Star to navigate the seas. So we've um, adopted that name basically because we're in Northern Adelaide. So therefore we're the Northern Star or the guiding star uh, for entrepreneurs and businesses um, out in Northern Adelaide. However, a, a lot of the people that we actually engage with and provide services to are now way outside those boundaries. So we've extended that to Northern Adelaide, not just City of Salisbury, uh, but for example, one of our mentors goes out to Denunda and works with two businesses out there and we work with people in other areas as well. So we welcome all businesses to come and talk to us um, if they need any guidance around entrepreneurship, business, commercialisation, all that sort of stuff. Um, our main goal, there's, there's sort of three facets to our work. It's the inspire. So, you know, you don't know what you don't know until somebody connects you to that. So when it comes to young people, people in the community, we want to provide them with the inspiration um, and the opportunity that they too can actually create businesses, become entrepreneurs. They might be tinkering in the shed with something. It's, you can do something about that. So it's that inspiration that anybody can actually, with ideas, can actually do something about it and learn. Um, the creation is around your self-employment, your small to medium enterprises, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, mum and dad businesses or husband and wife businesses and so forth, helping them to learn how to be good business people because we know often the drivers behind that is a passion. But to actually sustain that, you need to learn good business principles as well. Um, and then the growth. Um, we've got customers that have been, or clients that have been with us for 10, 12, 14 years. Um, I met a, a client today um, who's turning over $9 million a year, has been with us for about 13 years. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, we had a client come in and do a presentation, started off husband and wife, both had jobs, created a business, Levant Outdoors, um, and now they employ 11 people. Um, in Australia, about 41% of all employment is created by small business. That's 4.7 million Australians are employed through small business. So business wealth is actually community wealth. And we move into this space of 
Why do I do this? Is because I want to create job makers as well as job takers. It's important to have workers, but it's also important to have those organisations and businesses that create jobs and opportunity. Um, uh, up to 20 employees, um, the, the Commonwealth Government definitions, but for us, small, it could be husband and wife, it could be a, a franchise, it could be very small. Yeah, so we don't really stick to those rudimentary definitions. If you're doing business, we'll help you. Um, and we provide one-to-one -one mentoring. Uh, we provide group mentoring, we provide a lot of events and networking because we know that through connection people can actually expand their knowledge um, and discover their partners in business, discover the knowledge. A bit like what is done here, it's those connections that are really important uh, and we would bring in speakers as well. Um, a fair, uh, quite a bit of our um, services are free. Um, and then we've got some fee-for-service ones as well. So for you know businesses turning one and a half million dollars over a year, there's some fees involved in that, and that's to support the other services that we do in, in the organisation. Um, a little bit about 20, uh, 21 and 22, uh, just to give you some stats about the kind of work we do. Uh, very soon we'll be doing this year's uh, kind of stats, uh, but you know we work with about 500 businesses a year. Um, 20 new businesses in that year were launched um, and there's a few other things you can see there. We work with those business intenders. We use the word business intender because sometimes people might not understand the term of startup or entrepreneur. But it's, you know, if you've got an idea and you intend or have that desire to be your own boss or start your own business, uh, then we're there to help and guide you with some information to help that um, happen for you as well. Um, and also helping um, businesses uh, get funding as well. And we'll get to that because there's an important person, very important person in the room here today that has those skills that actually helps people with grants and research and development grants as well. Uh, so a little bit about me, those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Sasha uh, Dragovelic. Um, if, if you find it difficult to say Dragovelic, you could always use the term dragon in the village. Uh, it makes it sound like a really good Scottish name, uh, but it's actually Yugoslav. Um, I've got some experience around some of the businesses I've created, Boss Camp and Futurepreneurs Academy, which are programs for young people, predominantly sort of teenagers from 13 to 17 and then 18 to 25. Um, since about 2014, about four and a half thousand young people have been through my programs. I've also developed programs to, in a range of other organisations like uh, service to Youth Council, um, Hyper, helping people, young people achieve, Catalyst Foundation and just recently uh, Youth Options where we've created some programs to introduce people to business and entrepreneurship. Um, and I still run those businesses. Last weekend I ran a program for three young people in the Adelaide Hills Council and the week before that I was a judge on something called Fish Tank at the Unley Council. And if you've watched Shark Tank, this is the children's version of that, and the judges are much, much nicer, believe me, I'm one of them. So, um, But I've also run businesses in electrical, surveying and drafting, I've run a, an IT company out in, um, in Cuba PD, um, and one of the things I learned as a young person then is don't take on Telstra, you'll lose. Um, they're much bigger, and even they say they won't do anything if you start it, they'll open right next door and sell things cheaper and I found out the hard way. So a lot of the information that I help people with is also out of experience, learn and lived experience about what things work and what things didn't work. But also today in the room, um, and Dennis, could I ask you to stand up? Because you look actually like your picture. Uh, so this is my colleague, uh, Dennis uh, Subasi, and Dennis is our senior business advisor at um, uh, the Polaris Centre. So please, this evening, if you haven't already had a chance to talk to him, get his card, talk to him, meet him, uh, because he's an incredibly amazing senior business advisor to have here in Adelaide, and we have him at Polaris Centre, so nobody else can have him. Uh, you can access him there. And, and Dennis is a global entrepreneur. Um, we sometimes use the word serial, 
uh, but it's also associated with other things as well. So, but yes, he is a global entrepreneur, worked in Germany, Switzerland, China, Hong Kong, is a business owner, has enormous experience around commercialization, manufacturing, um, business process improvement, and, and, and you name it. I couldn't fit all the experiences that Dennis has on here, so you need to talk about. Yesterday I found out about an AI tool um, that you can upload a video and it gives you a one page summary of all the information in that video that you can read through and save yourself an hour worth of watching. So this is the kind of experience and knowledge that there's an, uh, Dennis has. He's also uh, certified in, in business management. There's a lot of certifications that sit behind that as well. So please get to know Dennis um, and you'll be able to access some of those services uh, with Dennis. Um, we also have um, another lot of team. This is our entire team. Um, over to uh, my right, um, we've got Leandro, who's our manager of city shaping. Uh, so our team sits together with the strategic planning of the entire city of Salisbury. Where are the employment lands? Where are the places we build factory that employ lots of people? Where are the tech hubs? Where is the transport to get to those sort of things? Uh, the residential, the way that the, the, the city looks. Um, what do we do about economic development? Um, helping businesses, inviting investment and so forth. All those things are actually linked. You wouldn't think that the physical planning of the place is linked to economic development, but they actually work hand in hand because you've got to have all those things working together. Um, Janet there is our events and operations uh, coordinator and she looks after a lot of our events. Absolutely amazing. Been with uh, the Polaris Centre for like 19 years. So knows a lot of stuff there as well. And then of course me and Dennis and Rob um, is one of our senior business mentors who used to run something called Miniscaf, if you've ever heard of it. It was a place in, in uh, Adelaide and uh, Alulite Windows was a man manufacturing company for many years. You wrote patents for Rob. Rob retired, so sold those b businesses and retired and somebody actually realised his knowledge and experience and I don't know how, but I'm glad they did got him to work for us as a business mentor and he's been with us for about 12 years or something. Um, Rob is 77 years old and he still works four days a week, probably about two or three clients a day, even goes out and sees clients. But that wealth and experience, most of those clients that have been with Rob for about 10 or 11 years um, know him now as Uncle Rob because he's seen their kids grow, he's seen their businesses grow and again, what Rob doesn't know probably doesn't matter in business. So this is the kind of stuff that we're talking about um, at Polaris. Um, and it's, no. sorry, uh, Rob Chisholm. Let's come up with a. Yes, Rob Chisholm. Um, so highly, highly experienced person. He also delivers our business fundamental programs. You know, before you sort of, he, he talks about before you hang the sign, what do you need to do before you hang that, that sign and open that business. Um, and there's Rob in action there. I thought I'd just throw that in. Um, he's been around for, for quite a while. So um, what, are we, what are we thinking of uh, uh, the learning outcomes to, today is around that um, uh, idea being your responsibility and I'll talk to that a little bit. Um, the entrepreneurial process as it sort of is used now but probably I would estimate about five million entrepreneurs a year worldwide so I want to introduce you to those uh, tools uh, that are some of the basic building blocks and then from there you move on to some of the more complicated stuff that we're probably used to as far as business plans, strategic plans and so forth but you've got to start somewhere um, and that entrepreneurial process is really important. Um, and I know it might be a little bit controversial, but I want to also put it out there that my thoughts are that entrepreneurship and business are two separate things. They require two separate set of skills. Often people get business and entrepreneurship confused, but I reckon there's two separate skill sets and processes involved there. Business, so you go and do a cert for in business or a diploma or a degree in business, it's more about managing, administering the business, managing your staff, reading balance sheets, 
um, your record keeping and all of that. Entrepreneurship is the step before that. Taking that idea and making it a business, which requires a range of skill sets. You may not need to know about GST and tax and HR policy at the point where you've just got an idea and you want to make that a business. Of course, those skills are really important later and that's what we're talking about today. We're looking at that entrepreneurial process, the step before you've got the business, before you're trading, what do you need to do to test that idea? Um, I'm going to talk about the dream team. Um, and can I say for those sole inventors, sole entrepreneurs and sole traders, um, you can't be everything in the one person. And we'll explore that a little bit. And I hope that you take that with the spirit that I'm going to give it, uh, because sometimes people can get a little bit touchy around when we're talking about a skill set. Um, sometimes we try and squeeze a lot out of us individually and need to recognise that there's some skills we need to bring in to support that process. And that's a really important part of our journey and discovery to know that we've got to bring others in as well. And I'm going to share with you a networking secret um, at the end of it that will make all the difference to help you progress your ideas. Um, but I'll just leave it there. Around your idea and your responsibility, it really reminded me of what um, Steve Jobs said. Um, if you are working on something exciting that you're excited about, that baby that you've got, um, you don't have to be pushed. People don't have, oh, do this and do that. You're pulled by that vision. You're pulled by that excitement. And that's really, really important. You're not looking for somebody else to do it for you. You're the driver in that bus and you need to get the right people on that bus to help you proceed, pro progress with that. Um, over the last probably 10 years, I talk to a lot of people um, and often it's about people don't get my idea. They're not supporting me with my idea. And the reason for that is because it is your idea, your responsibility. When you have a baby as a parent, you can't just hand it off to somebody and say, hey, can you look after them for, and I'll come back in 15 years when they're all good. Um, or maybe when they finish that degree or they've uh, you know, done that drive. All those steps are your responsibility as a parent. So as an entrepreneur, a founder, a business owner, it's your responsibility to drive the progress on your idea. And it's up to you to get the right people on that bus. But in the end, you're the person driving that bus. You're deciding where you're stopping, where you're turning, who you're letting off, which is just as important as who you let onto that bus. Sometimes people will come in just for that time you need them and at the next stop you're going to say, thank you very much, could you get off now? That's just as important as identifying who comes in and out of that business. But ultimately, you are that driver of there. Um, and, and let me just get this clear about the definition of entrepreneurship. Because one of the biggest things I hear that people say is, if I only had a million dollars, or if somebody only gave me a hundred thousand, or if somebody just gave me two weeks of their labour for free to help me, we'd, we'd, we'd all be saved. But the definition of entrepreneurship is the pursuit the pursuit of opportunity beyond the resources you currently control. So if you're not pursuing your idea or your invention or your innovation, even though you haven't got the people, the money, the tools, the skill, the knowledge, are you really an entrepreneur? Because an entrepreneur will go for it even if they don't have those resources. Again, as that driver, you need to be the person to find those resources, to find who has those resources, and to convince them to, to get on the bus with you. Does that make sense? And can I also say one of the other truths I would like to share is that if your only pursuit of that invention, that innovation, that amazing idea is to make money, it's the wrong way to look at it. Because what happens when you don't make money? You feel 
you feel miserable and it's like that's over. And I don't know if you've heard of the story and I won't get, it, get go into the deep depths of it, but when the Wright brothers took flight, um, did you realise there was a second company competing at the same time? The Wright brothers had no money, no knowledge. They weren't engineers. The people on the other hand, and look this story up and have a look at it, had all the money in the world, had an incredible team. But they were after the money, the fame, and to be the first. When the Wright brothers became first, guess what that, that alternative competitor did? They walked away. Instead of joining them and saying, fantastic, how can we help you? How can we make this better? How, now that you've done it, how can we use our resources to make it better? They said, no, nah, we're not first, see you later. And literally walked away from that. Why? Because they were driven by money to be the first at something. The Bright Brothers was a challenge, it was a problem worth doing, so therefore they took it on and they got it done without those resources. It's a mindset. Entrepreneurs have this mindset that once you achieve something, and, and you know, let's mention Elon Musk, PayPal, gave the world a secure payment system that has created all the other secure payment system. When they achieved that, what did he do? Sold it, went into Tesla and SpaceX. When he's got that up and running, guess what? He's going to sell it and move on to something else because it's about giving the world something. Um, it's about focus. It's about willingness to see the, the, the possibilities. And the other thing about entrepreneurs is, is that adaptability under pressure. You know, you're, you, you sort of move with the, with the tides and, and the needs in your, in your business, in your idea. So there's some things there that we need to think about that if we're taking this on, if we're going to have this baby, that there are some responsibilities that we need to be very, very clear and at least have that mindset that, you know what, it's my responsibility and I'm going to do something about it. All right, now I'm going to give you some tools that are commonly used, like I said, by about five million entrepreneurs worldwide every year, um, that we also use in a lot of our education around helping people take that idea to commercialization. Um, there we go. So the entrepreneurial process is as simple as this these days. There's your idea. We're gonna look for a business model is it feasible? Is it desirable? Um, is it viable? We're going to test some of those theories. Then we're going to do some testing. And if, if, if something comes amiss there or something doesn't work or some feedback comes back, we go to, you remember the old term that we used to use? You go where? Go back to the drawing board and you have another go. And because you're an entrepreneur, entrepreneurs will continue failing until they succeed. We don't stop when we fail. We will continue failing until we succeed. So we go back. What did we learn from that testing phase? Do we need to enter something? And then we get to this MVP. Now, when I ask most of the teenagers what MVP stands for, what do you reckon the answer they tell me? Most valuable player. And that is right in sport. But for us entrepreneurs and inventors, when we say the words MVP, who can tell me what we mean by MVP? Oh, beautiful, thank you. Gold star to you, sir. Minimum viable product. Now let me define that in everyday terms. It doesn't have to be perfect. And a lot of companies have actually learned that that if you release something that is almost okay, does the job, guess what your first adopter community does? It provides you with lots of feedback. Mm. Oh, that doesn't work, it should have this feature. And then they rebuild it. Have you noticed a lot of software that goes out into open source? How does it become great software? It's all the feedback. But do you remember back in the old days what we used to do? We used to spend months and years testing something before we released it, and then nobody wants it. 
The best way to find out what people want is to do a minimum viable product, not make one million units, make 500 units, release them, and then in 12 months, so I often say, you know, don't buy any software for the first 12 months. Wait for the community to find all the bugs, and believe me, there are very dedicated people out there. Just ask some of the gaming young people out there. They will tell you that the lighting's wrong, that feature that jumps not high enough in the game and so forth. They go back and redevelop it and make those features and then release. Have you heard the term beta versions? Minimum viable product and then we release it commercially. So we test some of that. Before we spend millions of dollars producing a million of them, just to find out that we're actually creating a business model for the reject shop, cheapest chips, the $2 shop. Because all of those products in there started off as $200 products, $500 products, and you can buy them now between $2 and $50. That's where they end up because they didn't do their market research or build their minimum viable product. Once you've got the information on the minimum viable product, you now have been given the permission to look at scaling. <coughs> Take it to the next level. Build more of that. You know, it could be things, have you heard the term that you've released a whole bunch of red buckets out there? Nobody buys them and the feedback comes back and saying everybody wants blue ones. It's not a difficult thing to go back to change the colour injection in the, in the moulding to create blue ones but you, you do those 200 first and then you go out and produce a million blue buckets because that's what your market wants. Uh, whereas back in the day we used to just throw a bunch of money at things and hope for it to work. Part of this entrepreneurial process, there's two tools that I want to share with you this evening that are, that are used, readily available. Most of the information is free. People like myself and the Polaris Centre, we also give direct guidance on how to use those tools but today I'm just going to show them please look them up they're readily available there's books on them there's YouTubes on them to help you with each of the aspects of these tools um, the first one is something called the business model canvas who said of the big business model canvas oh we've got one person I reckon Dennis you might have heard of it yeah um, it is a one page nine square boxes tool and when you see it, you'll realise, oh wow, this is so easy to use. And there's a lot of information that sits behind it. But the idea is that you take your idea and you put it through this business model canvas and you can make 10 of these, 100 of these. Go and have a look at the business model canvas for Airbnb, for Tesla, for BMW, for a lot of the main companies out there. And you'll see how it has been used to iterate and fine-tune that idea or that business idea before it's gone fully commercial. What are the nine main aspects of taking an idea to a business is this. Customer segments. Who are your customers? Is there a primary, secondary, tertiary market that you need to consider? Let's go with the primary first. And when that's up and running, we'll go to the secondary and tertiary. Um, the value proposition. What, what value are you providing your customer? Let's really look at that. Not what you think the value is, but talking to your customer and understanding from them what they think the value is. What do they want? The old way was, this is a fantastic bit of technology, buy it. Now you want to actually communicate that value proposition. The channels, how are you going to deliver it? Is it electronic? Is it with a truck? Is it so? Working out some of those early bits of thinking before you get out to market. Customer relationships. Do you want a personal relationship with your customer? Do you want the money to contact online? Is it self-service? Remember the time we used to go to the service station and somebody would come out to pump petrol for you? These days it's all self-service. Do we complain about getting out of the car, putting fuel in and swiping? No, we love it. It gives us choice and control as customers. Now, back in the day, you couldn't even actually get out of the car because somebody would be offended. Oh, no, no, you can't get, oh, no, we'll do that for you. We'll wash your screen, we'll check your oil. 
well, actually, I can do that myself. No, 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 we don't allow that here for safety reasons. Do you remember that? So it's about what does your customer want and ultimately what are they willing to pay for? If they're willing to pay for that, who are we as the founder, the entrepreneur to stand in their way of them giving us money for a service? Revenue streams. Let's look at and explore how we're going to make money here. Is it cash? Is it 12 month subscription? What's the really cool one now? Monthly subscription, the service model. People want to pay you each month. Are you going to knock back that money or that request from people to pay you monthly instead of yearly? Oh, no, no, we, we do a yearly subscription of $1,500. No, you can't pay your insurance monthly. And now it's everyday work. So let's listen to our customers. How do they want to pay us? Let's look at the key resources that we need. Let's look at you know, and, and for young people, I say, is a, is a key resource or a key partner mum and dad? If you haven't got a driver's license and you've got to do business, who's your key partner? You've got to be nice to dad because he's going to drive you around. Or mum might actually lend you her station wagon and so forth. So it's really about thinking of who are those people that, if you didn't have them, would your business operate? And that includes people like your suppliers. Guess what we found out during COVID about suppliers? Overseas suppliers. What do overseas suppliers prioritise? Their country, where their factory is. And if your business is relying on that supply and they're a key partner and you haven't thought about alternatives, when that tap turns off, your business also turns off. So it's really important to keep those things into perspective. What are the things, the activities you need to do every day to make sure that business, invoicing, marketing, stuff like that. Have you got your hand up or? No, no, no. Just yeah. Just let, um, it's really important to really nut down what are the essential activities you must do without fail to ensure that your idea goes from idea to business, you know? Um, my mentor years ago, and I don't know if I've shared this with you, Leonard, he said, Sasha, when times are tough, market like hell. When times are good, market like hell. What happens when in most businesses, and I've seen this literally happen, when everything's going really well, I've got a full order book, guess what people do, the first thing they do is they cut the marketing dollars. Oh, we've got plenty of business, let's stop marketing. Everybody knows about us. Business all of a sudden goes, everybody's forgotten about you. They're the kind of key essential things that you've got to continue doing. And what are your cost structures? What are your fixed costs, variable costs? And like I said, when we go through this in a training program, we dive deep into each of these and what they actually mean. So please look up the business model canvas on the internet. You can print stuff, there's free material, there's videos and so forth training. There's a range of experts that have written the books on each one of these components and how you, you can go as deep as you want. Sometimes I do three, three hour sessions on each one of them over 12, 12 weeks to help people learn how to actually process an idea through there. Um, has anybody noticed a line between the first five and the last four? I was going to ask why. You were going to ask why. Has anybody worked out what might be the difference between the top five and the four, top uh, and the bottom four? Any idea? Internal and external activities. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? You're on the right track. I'm just thinking about um, so value proposition, customer segments. All that relates to how the business is presenting itself to the people, and all the other stuff is. What, what's happening behind the scenes, right? Hugely smart. Have you heard me talk before? No. no. <laughs> um, so you can see the top five, the most important, are customer facing. It's all about the customer. That's what the customer sees, interacts with, um, where they do business. Those are behind the scenes, the back office kind of stuff. So it's really important to what we do when we run the business model canvas 
is the first five things we consider is what? The customer. Because if there are no customers, there's no business. Thank you uh, very much, Patricia. Um, I've known a lot of startups who get grants to do research. Uh, Mum and dad give them money to start their business. And the first thing I ask is how many customers you got? Oh no, we've got no, no customers. But we've got, we've got $200,000 in the bank or we've got a million dollars in the bank. The bank has given us, we've got, we've got plenty of money. We're, we're gonna have our doors open, you know. Sooner or later, if you're not transacting with real customers, which is the real measure of whether you've got a business, that 200,000 from mum and dad or that money from the bank is going to run out. And if you've got no customers, what happens? Oh, fit is in. You, you close, close the doors. So that's why it's really important when I talk to these startups, that's great, you've got some seed money, but you've got to get customers tomorrow. Because in the end, it's the customers that is the test of a real business that will keep your doors open or pay your bills. numbered from one to nine, when a new business or one of your students would be mapping their business on this canvas, they would start, obviously, from one to nine? Absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're in sequential order. First thing, let's start with the customer. Who are they? What do they do? Um, we get down to really specifics. Um, um, I do a really funny thing for the young people. I do, I've got this silhouette of a gingerbread person. And I say, on that gingerbread person in the middle, I want you to list all the characteristics of your customer. How old are they? What gender are they? How much do they earn? Where do they live? What car they drive? Because that's how specific we've got to get with customers. And externally around the gingerbread person is where do you talk to them? Where do you find them? Where do they hang out? So you can talk to them about your business. Because people who come to me and pitch, and I hear lots of pitches, my product is for everyone. Young and old, any, everybody will love it. It's totally inaccurate. Even sliced bread is not for everybody. I bet there's a few people here that make their own bread and don't buy bread. You know, people will spend hundreds of dollars on a bread maker on their, in the kitchen cupboard to make their own bread. So even sliced bread is not for everyone. Great question. The next two I want to introduce you to, uh, before I do that, raise your hand if you're an engineer of any kind. Any kind. Well, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that a lot of you guys are actually electrical, mechanical, whole range electronic computer engineers. The next tool was designed by you, uh, for you by engineers in a university. For the reason being that if you put three engineers in a room to work on an invention, the only thing they're going to focus is on the technology, the item, the physical thing. Look how good it is. Can you imagine the calculations we did in that? The algorithms that are involved in that. What don't engineers, three engineers in a room, tend to think about? The customer, the people, the humans. And what we've learned in this day and age is you don't start with the technology or the item, you start with the human and the problem. And that's how you find a market. So here it is, folks. You may have heard of it, uh, but it's actually what we call human-centered design. It was specifically designed and used to help engineers in the university create commercial products that humans want to buy and use. Because most of the stuff that was coming out was fantastic technology, incredible inventions, but nobody wanted to use them and nobody wanted to pay for them. And as you know, what do universities live on? Commercialization of their units and research. So really important. Um, we talk about it these days to make it easier for thinking, uh, people. We, talk, uh, we call it design thinking. Have you heard that term before? Design thinking? But the original HCD is human-centred design and this is the process of it. 
empathise with your human person and their problem. Find out what their, what their problems are, what their jobs are, what their pains are, what their pleasures are. What does Panadol do? Ease the pain, remove the pain. Can you think of many other pains we have in the world that need to be, you know, cooking dinner for the kids? You know, takeaways are great Panadol <laughs> for easing the pain of having to cook a meal at home and the kids saying, oh, don't like that, I'm not going to eat it. So think of it in that sense, that there are only two things that your product or your service or your invention should do remove a human pain, and I don't mean literally headache, but it could be, but it, it, something that icks somebody, having to work to work. A car fixes that pain, public transport fixes that pain. Having to catch a three month boat trip across the sea to visit another country. A plane fixes that pain of having to do that. On the other hand, we're talking about pleasure. Does your product or service or invention give people pleasure? And I can see there's some puzzled looks on people's faces. Entertainment. When you put a nice Cadbury chocolate in your mouth, what do you feel? Pleasure. <laughs> Don't you? Um, when you watch a wonderful movie on TV, what is the entertainment? Escape, pleasure. Those sort of things. So think of those. If it doesn't fit pain or pleasure, commercial, and you know, I'm, I'm looking at you, Mr. Howard, you know, there's a lot of things that come that don't do any of those. It might be a while before that will develop into something like that. Definer, IDA, keep going through it. Prototype. I don't know if you've heard now, but when somebody comes up with an idea for a series on TV, They've got to make at least three of the first episodes before a producer will even look at it. The idea is no longer enough. Then test it and then come back. Again, an entire program and course on each of these things. Business model canvas, human-centered design or design thinking, look it up. There is some amazing processes there to take you from idea to business. And it's that point when you've got business and paying customers that then we need to look at how do we scale? How do we do tax? How do we do GST? These things are in your mind prior to that, but until it's a business, I've seen people rush out and build a website, spend, you know, five grand, ten grand on a website. They haven't even got a business yet. You've got to prove that first before you throw some of that money in there. Does that make sense? Cool. The next tool that I'm going to introduce you that's really important to the new entrepreneurial process is the pitch. Who said the term pitch? What's a pitch? When you explain your idea in a very short amount of time, you're very precise. What's the role of the pitch? To convince the person that um, your product is the best one in the world. No. no? But good try. It is everybody's try. A pitch, who's done a resume before? What's the job of the resume? To get you the job? No. A resume, the only job of a resume is to get you the interview. Nothing past that. It's the interview at the interview, it's the job of the interview to then get you the job and get you to referees. So the resume gets you the interview. The pitch, gets you the next stage so you can talk more about it. So you've got a very short amount of time to convince that person that it's worth them spending another three hours, another five days, another six months with you. And there are only three really important pitches these days in the world of entrepreneurship. Everybody's heard of this, the 60 second elevator pitch? When you're stuck with your hero in the elevator, you've got 60 seconds. And in that 60 seconds, this is what you've got to do. Who are you? What is your passion? Why? Why are you doing what you're doing? What is the problem? What is the solution? And you want their contact details. That's all. You just want to 
want them to say, you know, oh, that's interesting. Here's my contact details. That's it. You don't need to sell them. You don't need to get them and, you know, to invest there and then. You just want their contact details so that you can go to the next stage. The next one is the three minute, and that's usually around competitions and when you're presenting for investment. Again, this is to get you the invite to go back to talk to the board, to talk to their um, IP attorney and so forth. You, you want an invitation back. And that one is basically, this is the problem, this is my solution, this is what I need. This is the problem I've, I've faced or my customer faces. Here's the solution I and my team have developed and what I need is I need a partner, I need advice, I need money, I need resources, I need a factory, I need a car. What do you need to move forward? Again, you want an invite back. And probably the longest one, which is very rare that I've seen, is the five minute. And the five minute one is the problem, the solution, the market, the traction. How many customers you got? Five customers. Oh, fantastic. Who's your team? Who's on your team? It's just me. What happens if you get hit by a bus and I've just invested $200,000? Again, think of the investor. Think of the person and you. Do you really just want to hang on to all of that and go nowhere? Or do you want the intel about how you're going to progress? And of course, the ask, this is what I need. They're the three most important tools. Now, the rules around this is that for every minute, you need to do an hour preparation. That means practice your pitch, not prepare your pitch. All the information, the slides, all of that is outside of that. Once you've finished your pitch, you need a good hour to constantly practice it before you deliver it for every minute. And if you don't prepare an hour of actual practice in front of the mirror and so forth, you're not going to deliver it. So you need that preparation. The team, this is the one that's often uh, met, uh, missed. If you're a single sole trader or inventor, you can't possibly cover all of that. I'm yet to see somebody that covers that really well. You need a hustler on your team. Uh, the person that generates that interest, the extroverted person, the, the go-getter, the promoter, the, the loud person that talks, that loves what you do. The hipster, this is the person that's caring, creative, cares about what your customer feels like, what they, how they're going to react to your service or product, keeps you grounded, focusing on the customer, not just the thing, the item. And then the hacker are those people like the engineers. So imagine if your team is made up of three hackers. You get a great product, don't you, Mr. Howard? But do they care about the customer? Are they thinking about the customer? Have you, you know, getting out and pitching that is a very difficult thing. So it's really important to do that. It doesn't matter how many of each you've got, but that you cover all three okay. characteristics and skill sets. So you could have two hustlers, three hackers, and two hipsters, or you could have one of each. I often say in a startup team, whether they're paid, they have equity, they're equal shareholders, you need to cover those characteristics. You know? So you could be the hacker, the web guy, come up with a great technology, but dad's the hustler. And mum's like, yeah, but, you know, that doesn't look really good. The colours are pretty poor, you know. You need to cover those characteristics, whether they're paid people, whether they have equity, or whether you're, they're your friends, but you need to balance those attitudes there. David? What about, say, with the two hustlers? I've come across, it's, I've come across situations where you've got the, the real ultra go-getter that just jumps in before thinking and maybe 
may lead to a bad situation by jumping in too quickly. Could you complement that with having one who's a little bit more reserved, a little bit more thoughtful and say, hang on a minute, you're going to... That's why you've got the hipster. Because if you're a team, the hipsters say, hey, you're upsetting the customers. You're too forthright. So it's about the balance. That's, hipster, right? that's right. So when you identify those jobs, you say, hey, you're the one that's in charge of user experience, which means they're responsible for keeping the other two in check. So they'll go to this guy, the hacker, and say, doesn't help humans, great technology, but doesn't really solve a problem. Hey, you're insulting or upsetting our customers. And the hustler says, hey, you're too nice, we're not going to make any... So it's about achieving that balance in your team. Does that make sense? Yeah. Patricia? I just want to make a comment about um, we all have different personalities and I think it's, it's very um, difficult really to find these people, that you, the dream people, because sooner or later we're going to fight, we're going to have an argument, disagreement. So we need to have uh, respect, we have to have all these, these um, you know, values we have to have a clear goal, you know. So there's a lot of work that we need to do before we get into a business, because these are the people that you're either going to love or you're going to hate, uh, according to your own personality. Absolutely. This happened with, with me in different. Your team places. will change, though, Patricia. Of course. Remember the bus? Some people you allow on, some people you allow off at different levels and stuff like that. And let me just show you this. These are some of the biggest investors. They they started. Tech stars, but if you haven't heard of Startup Weekend, it's a world revolution. There's, it's all over. We've had several in here in Adelaide. We're having another one in Northern Adelaide. I spoke to these gentlemen when they were here from Boulder, USA, um, uh, in Adelaide about three or four years ago, and I said, as an investor, what do you re do? like? Honestly, like, let's cut the, you know, fluff and all the rest of it. I'm here. I've got this opportunity to talk to these amazing. Um, you know, entrepreneurs, um, innovators, investors that, that have got hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in investment out there. If I was to pitch to you, what are you going to look for? And I said, Sash, it's six criteria that we look for. And only six criteria every single time, and we do not deviate from this. The first thing we look at is team. The second thing we look at is team. The third thing we look at is team. The fourth thing we look at is, is there a market? Have you done your market research? Is there a potential market? The fourth thing we look at is how much progress and traction have you made? And what's the last thing they look at? Is it a good idea? Because what is there no lack of in the world? Ideas. Yeah, and unique ideas. Yeah. There's plenty. Uh, my mentor once said, hey, Sash, you know where the best billion dollar ideas are in the world? In the cemetery. <laughs> Why? Because people took them with them. They did nothing about them. So sometimes that risk, calculated, you know, risk, mitigated risk, should be taken but when I invest money in you, in your idea, I'm not investing in the idea. Because if you're gone, so is the idea. I need to see who's on your team. Do you have that balance of people in there? Um, can I rely on you that if I give you my money, are you a safe pair of hands? Are you going to do the right things with it? Are you going to, if I'm investing or giving you money, what do I want? I want a return. I don't want you to buy the best computer, buy a Mercedes Benz, buy a you know 63-inch Apple screen so you can do designs on. I want a minimum viable product that I can sell. I want a return on my investment, and I want to. And the only way I'm going to do that is by understanding you as a team. Does that make sense? Are you ready for the networking secret? Because you're about to put it into uh, um, practice. This is the biggest networking secret on the planet. And I very rarely share this except with my close friends, mentees, and very special people at presentations like with you guys. So it's not widely known. Are you ready? Mind-boggling stuff. 
Networking is connecting with others without the need for immediate gain. Connecting with others without the need for immediate gain. As inventors and innovators and entrepreneurs, when we corner somebody or we talk to them or a group of people, what's the first we try and do, thing we try and do? Sell them on our idea. Do we know anything about that person? Do we know what their values are, what their beliefs, how much money they've got? What kind of car they drive? Where do they live in Adelaide? How much, what kind of places they've invested? We need to connect with them first because if I came to you and said, I've got this brilliant idea, let's partner. You put in 100,000, I'll put in 20,000. It'll be all good. We don't know each other. We've got to develop a friendship. I call it the shipping business. Friendships, relationships, partnerships. And that's how it works. We get to know each other. We develop a relationship. We try a couple of things, see if it's going to work. And then we can become partners in business. It's the same with investors. You've got to get them to that point where they understand you as a person, as a team, to be able to do that. So remember, when you're networking, you're trying to find out who that person is, what makes them tick, what do they believe in, how much money they've got, where do they live, what do they value in life and community and business. And then at a later time say, hey, Leonard, remember we met at the Inventors Association thing and you said to me, you're really passionate about that. Look, I've got this thing, can I come and talk to you? Oh, sure, yeah, I know who you are, yeah, I remember you. Let's come and talk. And then you can go to the next stage. You've set the picture, the context, and then we can start talking business. Because now we've established a bit of rapport. And you know a little bit about me, I know a little bit about you. I'll go and check you out on LinkedIn, read some stuff. I'll Google you, read all those articles you've written and all those events you've attended. Oh. Connection is really, really important before that. David? Could you sort of flip that statement on its head the other way and say networking is, con is connecting with others while, um, while seeking long term gain? No. No? So it's immediate gain and long term gain? No, without immediate gain. You're there to learn, mm -hmm. to connect, to build a rapport with that person and you don't want anything out of it. So if you walk out that day and nothing happens, you have achieved a good working networking. Two words, Dale Carnegie. Yes. How to win friends and influence people. Yep, precisely. Um, and, and that's what um, um, Andrew, is it Andrew da Dale Carnegie? No, the one beforehand, Andrew Carnegie, the big metal billionaire in America, when he commissioned Napoleon Hill, I'm not going to give you any money. I'm just going to give you names. Go and talk to them. I will open the door. I'll ring them. I'll write a letter to say, I'm sending this guy. He's got no money. He's just going to connect and pick your brains. And he created the 17 rules of success worldwide. Um, think and grow rich and so forth. Cool. Folks, that's it for me. Thank you very much. I hope that was of some benefit. I know it's a really putting things in a nutshell and there's a lot of stuff that sits behind that, but I just wanted us to change our mindset a little bit about your baby and what you can do to progress that. So thank you so much for listening to me. Do we take any questions, Eric, or? Yeah? Oh. If you've got any questions, fire them. I will, yes. I'm glad we both know him. He's amazing. Incredibly experienced person. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Wow. So you were involved with Alulite as well as Minisgap or? Yeah. 
So this was back in the day when you had timber windows and you had to rip them out and he was probably the only company back then that you could actually build these uh, or to, made to measure weird kind of measurements in the old houses and replace them with an, a great aluminium window. Yeah. Yeah, back in the day when you, yeah, all of those things were in their development, weren't they? Yeah. Mm. yeah. No, he, and he went through some pretty tough times. Mm. Yeah, it's not easy. You're, you're raising a baby, then he becomes a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> um, Leonard? Yeah, that's absolutely. I'm taking a lot of time. Um, Sash, you talked about before return on investment, and I suppose when an investor is looking for that ROI. I'm just trying to picture like what could that even look like in terms of return investment? Would that look like more clients? Or how do you go about asking uh, what that investor, how do you add value to that investor? Well, you've got to know them. Mm -hmm. Some people will invest money and want a higher return of money. Yep. Knowing a little bit about you and for example, being a not-for-profit and so forth, a lot of people, philanthropists, they want social change. So the return on their investment is impact and outcomes for the community. All right? So they're going to give you money. They don't want money back because they're a philanthropist. They're granting you that money. But what they want is they want to see that money being used in the community and the return on, in, on that investment is impact. You know, a safer community, a connected community, um, social housing for homeless people. That's the return on that investment. So not so much even a, like a material benefit for the business as such, more a social benefit. That's right. Philanthropists, when they give money, right. the return is the, the impact in the community okay. or for that, for that purpose. Okay. Yeah. Sir? I was oh. going to ask you what your biggest mistake was, but I'll rephrase it. What's been your biggest learning opportunity? So my biggest learning opportunity is when I was young, um, and I mentioned Telstra before, full respect, loved the organisation, but it, it goes to show that about picking your battles and, and doing that stuff. Um, one of the problems we had in the community in Cuba PD, uh, it's a remote community, if you don't know, 900, 800 kilometres from here, um, in the middle of the outback. Uh, this was the time of dial-up internet. Um, now you guys down here, you guys down here, back in those days would be charged 25 cents for as long as the call lasted, right? Plus your internet fees. In places like Cooper PD and remote areas, you got slugged the time you spent on the internet and STD calls, long distance calls. And that was really expensive. So we used to do things like dial up, download our emails, switch off, read our emails, uh, then get back on. But I discovered this is happening. I also found out, because I worked for the council there, that Australia's largest optical fibre system and first fibre system that went from Adelaide to Darwin came right into the city centre of Cooper Pedy and then out again to Alice Springs. And I knew I can actually picture where the box was. And I said, hey, Telstra, we're out in the middle of nowhere, we've only got the ABC and Imparja, and, you know, internet's really important for business and local community and, and so forth. Um, I know you can do it. I know the technology is available. Um, we really need to do this for the community. No, not interested. Uh, well, how long are we going to, you know, is it going to be before we catch up with other metro areas? Oh, three, four, five years. I said, well, okay, fair enough. I've asked the questions, got the information. Um, I was down here, I bumped into, an, through a networking event, I bumped into the state manager of, back then it was Hutchison's Electronics, which is iPrimus, um, who had a facility here in the CBD. And I mentioned it to him, he says, oh, so you're really interested in, oh, you know, I'm a planner on the council, I'm a local entrepreneur, I run an electrical business, all these sort of things. Um, he says, we'll partner with you. If you haven't got it, we'll partner. So we set up a server, we connected, um, probably about 200,000 of my own money, plus their money, so it was quite a, a looked after it myself, worked with technicians, learnt how to run it. 
and all these people just dialed into the server and in three months later, right next door, Telstra shut up shop and undercut all those monthly plans and provided everybody with. And my learning was, you know, you need to get some things in writing, don't rush, um, make sure there's some things in place, don't I mean, it was a feel good after that because I'd learnt a lot and, you know, recovered from those sort of things. Um, but I, what I learnt from that sort of stuff um, is that um, I helped get dial up internet to the community a lot sooner than it ever was going to get there. And I was part of that team, although that, that grouping. I grew up there. I grew up there. Yeah. Okay.